purposeful. And so we start off with a declaration that we serve and we serve underneath a God who is mighty and great, who can be trusted, not just because of his greatness, but because of his love and his faithfulness to us. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the chance to draw together this first day of this year. And we start this, this year saying that we are s- submitted and bowing before you. We acknowledge you as our mighty God who controls and created and who destines everything. And so, Lord, we submit ourselves to you this morning as our great God. We worship you as we sing this song of your might and your power. Amen. Please stand, join me as we start 2017 with I Sing the Mighty Power of God, 128 in your hymn book. Sing out. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command, and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed where'er I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky, there's not a plant or flower below but makes thy glories known and clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne while all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy care and everywhere that man can be thou god art present there please be seated Good morning, everyone. I'll be reading, let's find out. Psalm 135, I just found out about 10 minutes ago. Uh, Psalm 135, it's, I am told, on page 616 in your pew Bible. Psalm 135. Praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, you servants of the Lord. You who minister in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to his name, for that is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob to be his own, Israel to be his treasured possession. I know the Lord is great, that our Lord is greater than all gods. The Lord does whatever pleases him in heavens and on earth, in the seas and all the depths. He makes the clouds rise from the ends of the earth and sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. He struck down the firstborn of Egypt, the firstborn of people and animals. He sent his signs and wonders into the midst, Egypt, against the Pharaoh and all his servants. He struck down many nations and killed mighty kings. Shion, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kings of Canaan. And he gave their land as an inheritance, an inheritance to his people, Israel. Your name, Lord, endures forever. Your renowned Lord through all generations, for the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, nor is there breath in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. All you Israelites praise the Lord. 
House of Aaron, praise the Lord. House of Levi, praise the Lord. You who fear him, praise the Lord. Praise be to the Lord from Zion, to him who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Will you just uh, bow your hearts in prayer with me for this praising of the Lord? Father, we thank you for such a magnificent psalm to begin our first Sunday in the new year. Lord, we pray that you would just quiet our hearts this morning and that we could truly give you the praise that you deserve. Father, help us block out all that distracts us and may our minds just take a moment to just dwell on you and your greatness. Lord, the words of this psalm are so rich and full of all that you do. As a congregation, we want to just unite our hearts in praise, Lord. And just as I was thinking of this prayer, Lord, I thought how inadequate my words are to uh, describe the greatness of you, Lord. But Father, we can praise you this morning for what we have experienced of you and what is so true of you. And we can say, great and mighty is our God. Father, we praise you because there is none like you. You have called us your people who hear your voice and follow. And it is just wonderful for us to contemplate this morning for a moment that we are truly yours and that you are our father. You are the perfect father, the loving father. And when life here on earth gets too hard and difficult for us when we get discouraged or feel heavy burdens, Lord, you say, bring them to me and leave them there. You remind us again that there's nothing that is too hard for you. There's no problem, no situation, Lord, that you don't have a plan for. Lord, you know the secret longings of our hearts, you know our deepest hurts, you know our failings, and yet you still say, come. Come to me and I will make good of it, Lord. Father, you have been ever present. You are our rock, you are our shield, you are our shelter. So we can praise you, Lord, and just say there is none like you. Father, you also have given us Jesus Christ to take our place. How amazing. We can't even fully comprehend that, Lord, when we think of our own sinfulness, all that he has done for us. Father, you're faithful to forgive us again and again and again, and you pour out our love, your love to us, and your love knows no limit, Lord, an everlasting love. Help us to love others with that type of love. Father, there is none like you, so we can praise you this morning because you're all these things and you're so much more in our life. Help us to begin this new year, this morning, this day, this week, the months to come, with praise every day on our lips to you. And Father, as the psalmist has said, bless us, bless our congregation, bless, bless us here, Lord, as we gather together to honor you. And may we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand, join me again as we sing 21, O four a thousand tongues to sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease, tis music in these sinners' ears, to his life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise he dumb. The or loosened tongues employ. Be blind, behold your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the 
earth abroad the honors of thy name. Please be seated again. A few of our announcements, some things that you need to be aware of, things coming up that are really good. We have a whole bunch of stickers on the walls and after the announcements and uh, we're going to have a couple people here explain what those stickers are. Those people that, that are going to do that um, were going to tell me last night I'm online to do this. I didn't hear from you so you're going to decide it right now that you're going to be one of the ones that stands up and tells us why there are stickers on the walls, what they refer to and why that was a wonderful thing to take part in last night, the production of these stickers and what was behind it. Ushers, if you'll come forward, we'll receive our offering. Nate, you need to do something with that sound? Thanks. Deacons and deaconesses serving us but taking our offering, wonderful. Father, thank you for the presence of this congregation into a house in which we have dedicated ourselves to honor and to worship you. We bow before you now as your servants, and we come and serve you with what is the produce of our hands and the fruit of our labors. Lord, we want even this to honor you. And so, Lord, we give with not hearts of sufficiency, but we give with hearts that recognize that all we have has come from you. We are dependent upon you, and in this offering, we declare to you that we trust you with our lives, even with our money. Lord, bless the use of this offering that it might enrich the kingdom of God, that it might spread the glory of Christ to many new places, into many new lives, and win new territory in lives that have already submitted to you, but Lord, uh, can experience you in a deeper way. Bless, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. This is uh, our first Sunday of the month, and we have our communion, and we will take two offerings today. Uh, we told you last month that the second offering would be in relationship to expenses related to uh, Joy's dental surgery and work she had done. We don't need to do that today. Uh, the week that we had the collection, you provided beyond what we had anticipated, and uh, we were just blessed to be. Uh, and if you've interacted with Joy, you know the joy. Yeah, if you've interacted with Joy Landry, you know the joy of heart that your generosity has brought and the goodness and the health that that's brought. Uh, let me share a few announcements before, as the ushers, they're gonna come and pass the plates for our Deacon's Fund, which helps those in our community that are in need. Uh, a few announcements that are coming up. Uh, there is no projection, so you'll have to listen to me. Uh, the first one is the joy of a uh, baby shower coming up in just a couple weeks. The date is January, January 9. And it's gonna be here in the evening at seven o'clock. And uh, if you have seen the biblical phrase is great with child, and that's not relating to size, that's relating to the, the, just the, the beauty and the wonder of Bianca's pregnancy. And uh, this is a great thing, and that's what it means to be great with child. Uh, and we want you ladies, uh, it's, it's sad that this is a ladies event, but we want you ladies to come out and just make sure Bianca knows that she is loved and provided for and God has remembered her in this congregation. Uh, this is uh, somewhat will be surprising, not just to her, although it's not a secret, she knows it's coming. But the, the fact that she has come here, found Christ, found what it means to be a part of a people of God and that we would step forward and do this I don't know what is the part of whether they do this in Romania regularly, but I can tell you this shower will have an impact on her and on her family, and uh, even back in Romania, she tells the story. So ladies come out on the 9th at 7 o'clock for the baby shower. Uh, in the month of February, we will have the first of two seminars. February 25th, that weekend, we have a guy by the name of Glenn Havermackey, Glenn Havermackey, who actually comes from Dave's dad's in Peggy's church down in, in Wallingford, Connecticut. He's going to come and uh, just challenge us with a seminar about, about grandparenting. Not just about how to be a courageous grandparent, but how to be a grandparent that has a vision for what God 
can do through you to bless your grandchildren and those that are a generation beyond your first children. Uh, Courageous Grandparenting, the seminar will take place on Saturday. Then Glenn will stay with us and also take part on Sunday. He'll be here in three weeks to give us a kind of a prelim and, and excite us about the seminar. And if you are a grandparent, you really owe it to your grandchildren to be here for this. It will help you realize the wonderful gift you've been given and help you understand how to, how to really make an impact in that generation's life in a way that keeps doors open. So oftentimes there's, you know, we, anyway, it will be helpful to you. So the Grandparents Branding Seminar, uh, we'll need you to sign up for that. There will be a, a fee to take that to bring Glenn up. There's a fee attached to that as well as a great book for you to have during the seminar and to read afterwards to guide you in how to make a wonderful impact on the generations down from you. Then the next month we're having Daryl Whitmer from uh, Monson, Maine. He leads a group called uh, A2A. It is a, a group that goes around mostly New England and uh, talks to people about how to understand and explain and to set forth what they believe, especially in relationship to the other teachings that, that would pull people away from biblical truth. So A2A is a group that focuses on apologetics, speaking for the faith, and uh, winning people to Christ through a credible explanation of what is biblical truth. Daryl will be here on the f- March 25th, and that'll be another Saturday and Sunday weekend for us. Also, as we get further along, we'll have signups for that as well. It's a great follow-up. The winter is a tough time. Uh, Daryl is, is a wheelchair-bound person, so getting around in the middle of January is difficult. So he put us off from the middle of winter and said, can we do this once weather starts to improve? And so, but it will still treat it as a follow-up to Rael's apologetics class. And you'll hear from people that have a great credibility in New England as teachers of apologetics. Two great things coming up before us, as well as for the ladies, uh, a, a great baby shower coming up. Thank you for being here on this first day of the year. It's, it's a day that we want your attendance here to be a statement to God that we have prioritized you for this whole year. We're starting our year with you, and we want to journey this whole year together with you, God. Let me pray to that effect. Father, you have put us in the midst of an environment and a world that has so many pulls and tugs on us We want you to know today, Father, that we have given ourselves to you, and that's why we're here. We're here to not just receive, but to give, to declare, that you might see and you might know that we have made a commitment to you. And so, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, draw into your presence and to worship and to declare your glory. Lord, uh, you have blessed us already, though it was still the end of 2016. You have already blessed us leading into today. Now, Lord, give voice to those who were impacted last night that we might as a congregation uh, begin and journey through this year and end this year uh, more deeply in love, more intimately uh, involved with you, hearing you and being in your presence. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. There are stickers on the walls, and I'm going to ask a couple people to stand up. Uh, that maybe the first person can just explain why there are stickers on the walls and what they represent. There were about 40 of us, uh, 35 of us here last night. Wendy? Um, so I didn't get the chance to say that I would speak. I do have my dad preaching here, but that's okay. Um, Last night, I had to duck out a little early and go to work for a few hours. So when I got home, I was still kind of keyed up from work and was laying in bed at about 1 o'clock. And I was thinking, man, I just, I I was thinking I need to share something today. So we watched the War Room movie. um, And if you haven't seen it, if you were some of the people weren't able to come last night, you need to see it. Um, it's, It's just a powerful tool about being having a plan when you go to prayer and like you know the military people have a plan they don't just jump into a war but they have a plan of how to defeat the enemy and this is how to defeat the enemy by giving it to god in prayer ahead of time 
So these things, just to quickly represent, the, the woman in the movie taught another woman how to have a prayer closet. And she just had all the things that she needed to pray for. She had scripture all over her prayer closet. She literally had emptied her closet of all her clothes and made it just a prayer closet. It's awesome that she had the ability to do that. <laughs> um, so these are representing, after we watch the film, we put our different prayers, scriptures, whatever impacted us, how we want to have 2017 impact us for um, this, you know, how the, we want prayer to impact us. So these may be specific prayers, maybe just verses. I haven't gotten a chance to look at any other than what I wrote. Anyway, what I was thinking last night is, uh, this is the second time I had seen this movie, and it, it really meant a lot more to me the second time. Sometimes you get things, you know, the second time or third time you see something that you missed the first time. And I just felt like the thing that stood out to me that I put is not my will, but your will be done. And I felt like in prayer, there are so many times in life things come up, we react to them, we take matters into our own hands because we are such independent people, we can do it on our own but we cannot do it on our own. If we want to be spirit led, we need to get out of God's way and let him lead us where he wants us to go. And that just really hit me last night. We need to get out of God's way and go along behind him with him leading us. <laughs> There'll be another that will stand up and speak about the impact of the movie last night and uh, why what's on the walls and what we ought to do with these. Uh, Don and then Daryl. Don, you're first. And when you're done, if you'd walk, oh, Daryl, if you'd walk down and collect this from Don. I had seen that uh, one woman really reached out to another woman to help her save her marriage through prayer. Um, I saw that she was starting to mentor another woman and it brought back many flashbacks and it started back, back when Marvin's dad reached out to us, Joanne and I, a long time ago. And we had a small group and uh, uh, we moved to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and some others reached out to us. And over the years, some men reached out to me and spent some time with me. And I had memories of that's what was going on last night. This woman reached out to another woman to mentor. It's called discipleship. And I said, you know, over the years, people have tried to uh, build me up. Uh, some people might think that uh, it didn't turn out what they thought it would be, but um, I struggle with this. And I look back in recent years, I've just didn't care. I'm not spending much time with other guys. And it's a, you know, us guys, us men, we need to build each other up. And I look around and I'm giving eye contact to each one of you guys, I don't care how old you are or how young you are, we have a responsibility to share our lives, our heart with each other. And we need to help one another. And we're not doing it. We're not doing it here. And I need you guys to help me. I need to help you. That's what I got out of it. Uh, I was one of those ones that hadn't seen the movie yet. There was about a third of us last night, I guess, that didn't see it. And um, as I sit around and look, I, I want to ask the question, but I'll just hypothetically ask it. Um, have you seen the movie yet? Like Wendy said, um, there's not a better way of spending two hours other than maybe praying than watching this movie. And many of us watch enough TV during the week or month where uh, this two hours would just uh, really benefit and bless you. Uh, I shared last night, 
And I really echo what Wendy and, and uh, Don just shared. Uh, I shared last night that I was challenged and convicted by how unorganized, I guess I would say, my prayer life is. And, and it challenged me to become more committed and um, more dedicated to faithful prayer. Um, and whether that means carving out a space in my living space, you know, to do that without distraction or just, you know, making a better use of my time. Those were the things that really came away uh, for me last night, along with the, the responsibility we have to disciple and mentor, you know, other brothers and sisters in Christ and the, the real, you know, responsibility we have to just follow what God wants to happen. In other words, move out of his way and let him work, but be active in communicating and praying with him. Um, I think it was at the end of the movie that this verse popped up. I wanted to read it, and then uh, I wanted to pray for us as a congregation. It was Second uh, Chronicles seven, fourteen, and this is where uh, the Lord appears to Solomon after building the uh, um, the temple. Uh, the Lord says, "If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves." and pray and seek my face and turn from their ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Then the next verse actually goes on and says, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. And uh, I'd just like to stop for a minute and just pray for us as a congregation. These verses just pop out. I mean, I had some notes here. I think Phil prayed for this during our revival, or preached from this during our revival theme, you know, and, and just uh, the humbling, the seeking, the praying, the repenting. Um, you know, this just demands that we just stop and pray for our body. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this movie last night, and I thank you for the impact it had on those that came out. And Lord, I pray that as a body, we would humble ourselves. We would recognize our need for you. We would repent when repentance is required, Lord. And we would seek after you faithfully in prayer. Lord, make us a congregation that sets prayer a priority not only in maybe our, the closets of our house, but in our Wednesday evening prayer meeting, in our Sunday morning worship service, Lord. Um, I know Phil has, has led us in that direction, and I just thank you for a pastor that has just uh, not stopped reminding us the importance of prayer. Lord, I pray that you would just open your ears and eyes and would be attentive to the prayer that we offer in this place. As verse 15 said, Lord, make us a house of prayer. Revive us, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. Those that were um, last night, you understand what's on the walls, and perhaps you put one up. We are going to take just a moment or two and have a time of prayer as a congregation, and we're going to enter into our prayer closet. The title of the movie was The War Room. And the place where battles get taken and get accomplished is, is, not, <clears throat> is not in the kitchen, it's not in the living room. That's where we battle with each other. And that's where the enemy, that's where we get defeated. And that's where we get trodden down. That's where we lose. It's when we're fighting in the kitchen and we're fighting in the living room. We need to take our fighting into a closet. We need to take our fighting and our battling into the place where we battle against the enemy by engaging the one who has the resources to defeat him and his influence in our lives. And so there is a, the title of the movie was The War Room because the war room was that closet. While we have set aside a closet, we took one of our rooms here in this church. It was kind of like a closet and it was filled with uh, the things that were you know, the closets are filled with clothing and decorative and things. 
And we just emptied that out. We took the books out of there, we took the magazines out of there, we took the videos and the films and the CDs out of there, and we put them someplace else. They're, they're very valuable things, and we, and we treasure them, and they're, they're good, make use of our library. But we said, we need a spot that is a closet for us, where we can go and pray, and that's right around the corner. That is our prayer room. And uh, it is a great place for you to go into and engage together, especially together with somebody in battle. But this room here, if you actually think about what this room is, should be for us, this should be our war room. This should be where we come into the presence of God and we lay ourselves before him and say, God, we come to you because only you are the one great enough to deserve praise. Only you are the one who is mighty enough to demonstrate the, something that is praiseworthy. And God, we need you in our lives. That's this space is dedicated to that, for the praise of God, to, in the presence of God, and that we might have the prayer directed toward God. So there are, there are war room kinds of posters around our wall. I'm going to ask those of you who were, to, were here last night, uh, even if you don't lead openly with a loud voice in prayer, I'd like you to get up and go to a, one of the things on the wall and then I'd like four or five of you actually to pray off from what's on that wall. It might be a Bible verse that you're going to claim for this year. It might be a prayer request. It might be something that is a call to, to a change of life. If you were at the last night's war room viewing and activity and prayer time, get up and stand around one of these things. And then I'm going to ask four or five of you to lead in prayer. Don't wait for the other person to pray. You just begin praying after I, I'll start. Father, we come to you because only you are the one who has power to do the amazing things that are necessary. Lord, we are helpless apart from your power and your life in us. And so, Lord, we pray to you now because you are the one who has power and who has wisdom and who has love and goodness. Hear our voices.
people and the more than people just they never seem to cut it and that's because they're not you Lord help us to put our trust and our faith in you and Lord help us to pray for our leaders that they would also follow your leading as well Lord help us to, to not have anxiety and worry because we have a God who will take our cares and uh, you're a faithful God who's uh, worthy to take care of us so Lord help us to trust in you with all our Father, we enter into a continuing battle uh, for Scott and his surgery that's coming up on Tuesday. Lord, we ask you to heal and provide a good surgical outcome. Lord, even beyond that, we pray that you'll do surgery not just on the foot, but Lord, we pray that you do surgery on the heart. Lord, open his heart to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we pray. And Lord, we pray for Sue um, Lydia's mom, who's having surgery on her knee on Wednesday afternoon. Lord, we just pray also that you'll just bless there. Lord, we pray that she might know your sufficiency and that she might offer praise to you. Lord, thank you for your work in her heart and her life. And Lord, we pray that you'd use this as an affirmation to her of your love and your greatness. And Lord, we come as in, uh, joined together as fellow soldiers in the warfare, praying for... Um, this sister-in-law named Candy, uh, who has a, a mass on her lung newly found, Lord, we just pray that you would minister and care there and provide relief and health and, and a good outcome for that. Lord, we just pray that you'll bring peace. And Lord, wherever there's a need for the gospel of Christ to penetrate, Lord, we pray that this might be one of those occasions in which you step forward and use tragic circumstances to accomplish great acts of love and great acts of grace. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be challenged once again. Thank you for your grace that has once again brought us to the place of an opportunity to respond in obedience or respond in faith. Lord, would you, by your Spirit, continually prompt us this year to be soldiers, active and engaged, calling upon you, our great one, to lead and to provide and to accomplish things. Lord, as has been said, we are weak and we are failing and we have no power in ourselves apart from the power that is expressed through you in our lives. And so we submit ourselves to you. Lord, let this be a congregation that this year enters into the war room. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you to those that stood up as an affirmation of last night's great work of God. We're going to sing some songs now about worship before we have our communion time. Not a God alone. There it is. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You're the only God whose power none can contend you're the only god whose name and praise will never end you're the only god who's worthy of everything we can give you are god that's just the way it is you are god alone from before time began you were on your throne oh you are god alone and right now in the good times and bad you are on your throne oh you are god alone you're unchangeable 
You're unshakable. You're unstoppable. That's what you are. You're unchangeable. You're unshakable. You're unstoppable. That's what you are. You are God alone from before time began. You were on your throne. Oh, you are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, oh, you are on your throne. Oh, you are God alone. You are God alone. You are God alone. Oh, you are God alone. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the change, one thing remains, one thing remains. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. And on and on and on and on it goes And it overwhelms and satisfies my soul And I'll never ever have to be afraid One thing remains One thing remains your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love in death, in life. I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My debt is paid. There's nothing else that could separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love, it never fails, it never gives up, oh, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, your love.
precious cornerstone, sure foundation. You are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. So let the glory of your name be the passion of this church. Let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe you're all to us. Only Son of God sent from heaven hope and mercy at the cross you are everything you're the promise jesus you are all to us so let the glory of your name be the passion of this church let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe you're all to us. You're world is over we will see you face to face and forever we will worship Jesus you are all to us Jesus you are all to us you're all you're everything to us you may be seated In Psalm 135, it was a great record of God's activity with his people. The psalmist starts off with praise and then he just thinks about all that God has done for him. He talks about kings that have been just defeated and victory won and safety regrasped once again. He talks about God coming and doing amazing things with creation and amazing things with provision for his people. God has provided for us. God has sustained us. God has cared for us. And we said, oh, for a thousand tongues, if we could have a thousand people singing the praises of God, 
we would but scratch the surface of all that he's done for us. 2016 was a year in which God came and met with us and God was here. Whether we, whether we think back positively about 2016 or not is irregardless of the fact that God did come and God did bless and God was gracious and God was here. He calls us to acknowledge that. He calls us to speak and give praise and give acknowledgement that his grace has come into our lives. Real is going to come and he wanted us to have a word to, and that will be the nature of what he says to us today. I would like to thank everyone for their prayers and your, your concerns and your cards and your support. Um, I'd like to praise God for his, his great love and care. I'm going to try not to cry, but I don't know if I'll be able not to. I got a card, and in that card, I had this verse uh, this week. He, is, um, he performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be numbered. And what I experienced this week, some of, uh, two weeks ago, um, those miracles that cannot be numbered, First of all, he spared my life, and I thank him for that. <laughs> but more than that, he spared somebody else's life because I crossed the road to meet that tree that I hit, and there was no one there when I crossed, and I thank him for that. Um, I thank him for all the, all the friends that came forth and offered to help from someone coming forth to do my accounts while I'm out, because I'll probably be out four to six weeks. And in my business, that would have cost me all my cleaning customers probably. So I even had one brother that called out of the woodwork and offered to shovel my driveway because uh, Rita, you know, Rita's out of commission and she can't do that stuff even though she tries to and does and pays the price for it. Um, I just, uh, uh, the doctors, when I, when I went for my follow-up visits and when my, my regular doctor who's an osteopath came to my house to do a house call and when I greeted him at the door, he was in shock he couldn't believe after the reports he had received and read that I was able to walk without pain. I, I've suffered six broken ribs, but fractures in the spine. And in my follow-up doctor's um, visits this, uh, this past Friday, they couldn't understand why I wasn't in pain like I should be. And um, so I praise God for that. <clears throat> I just want to praise God for, for the fellowship with all of you. Thank you. And Rita wants me to thank you for your prayers and support too. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing our great Redeemer's praise. We come and celebrate communion this first day of the year. And we not only come into the presence of God, but we've come affirming that this is, this is the central point of our focus. The central point of our focus is not the, just the might and the majesty of God. It's not the, the wonderful even answers that God gives to our prayers. The central focus of our coming here is that God has sent his son to be the one who would save us from our sins who would take a broken world that had gone away from God and himself provide the means for that world to be brought back. That sin would be atoned for. That God's righteousness would, and justice would be met. And that a people undeserving could receive grace. When we come to this place, we praise a mighty and awesome God we praise a God that loves us and a God that reaches out to us in ways, even as we've heard, driving a car. But we centrally focus that it's on Jesus Christ, 
his blood and his broken body for us. That is the heart of our praise and worship. And it is the most dramatic and demonstrable thing in all of time, demonstrating to us the love and the grace and the wisdom and the goodness of God. You see it best here. I'm going to ask uh, Michelle if she'd give thanks for the broken body of our Savior. Father, we do truly give you all of our thanks and all of our praise for what you've done for us. Lord, we see evidences of your love every single day, but no greater evidence than when you went to the cross and died for us. We thank you now, and we give you praise. Amen. This represents his broken body, his willingness to sacrifice his life that you might have forgiveness of sins. Take eat in remembrance of him. And as the body spoke of the payment of the debt of sin and the forgiving of forgiveness, so the cup speaks of new life that has come. I'm, hang on to that, Daryl. Judy needs this. I'm going to ask Judy if she give thanks for the shed blood of our Savior. Our Heavenly Father, I'm overwhelmed this morning and from last night too at your grace, Lord. You have, you are the only God that is the most high priest in the order of Melchizedek that sacrificed yourself for us, Lord. And in this representation of your body and your blood, Lord, thank you for this, that we become your living stones, Lord, and that you are our precious cornerstone. Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you. We don't deserve anything, and you lavish yourself upon us. You became Emmanuel, God with us, and Lord, I pray that you would enable us through your Holy Spirit living within us to deliver grace and love and to live in the power of the cross that you died on, Lord, and that the victory you have already won would be lived out in our lives. Amen.
We've already eaten the bread. It was the payment for our sins. 2016 is done. Its sins and its activities have been settled. We no longer bear the weight of what took place in 2016. God has provided for that. And we hold a cup that is about life. And God has given us. He comes and he says, it's not 2016, but here I give you life for 2017. Live in my forgiveness. Live in my life. Live in my spirit this year. Drink this in remembrance of him. We stand and sing our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. My wife. In every way, we want to honor those people who sit down front <laughs> and not have them be, have to look at a tree the whole time. You. Now you may be seated. I want to share a brief from the Word. I want to get us back into the story of Jesus Christ. I'm going to drag it a little bit more. Good. It's very heavy and it's a great tree. After the service, it would be great if you'd come up and take one or two of those red tags and uh, take them home and make them a matter of prayer. Some of them are uh, intended just to be offerings on the tree. But that's fine, but it would be great to continue on with this prayer. Come up after the service and take one or two of them and take them home and make them a, a point for prayer. I want to get back into the story of Jesus. We've been talking, oh, kids' church. Yes, sorry, it dawned on me. Andrew, nice to see you back. We've got a few kids headed out. I promise to preach long so you don't have to cut your kids short. short. Yeah. It's a sacrifice I'll make. As God has progressed us along, he brought us into a, a real wonderful exposure of who his spirit was. And we finally, as a church, I think we... Uh, not finally as if it hasn't happened before, but in a new way, we gave understanding and we gave value and we gave worship and adoration to God's Spirit. And we come to understand the work of the Spirit and our dependence upon the Spirit in a new and vibrant way. But as we listen to the Spirit, we will hear one thing from the Spirit, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Pay attention to Jesus Christ. I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. The Spirit's voice is a voice that honors and exalts Jesus Christ. And after we finished talking about the Holy Spirit, we said we should find out more about who this Jesus is. And so we set out through the book of Luke, the longest and probably the most detailed of the gospel records about the life of Christ. We want to know Jesus. We want to, it, it was written to be a credible witness for who he was. It was written that we might believe in this credible witness, but it was really written that we would adore this credible witness. It's not enough that we come and see the record and see it as being, okay, this is the story. It's, there's reliability here. Luke did his research. That would be a great outcome. That you might believe that this person was who he said he was would be a great outcome. But more than to believe that you would adore this person, as we go through, we want you to develop an, a, a love and appreciation and, a, and just an open heart and a sensitivity and a giving of your heart to him. Not just an agreement about who he is, what he did, but a giving of your life and just wonder and adoration of who this man was. In chapters 1 through 10, we learned about this man. In fact, this God-man. And the man was a man of miracles. And the first opening 10 chapters, it's all about the miracles that he did demonstrating that he is not just man, but he's the God-man. And he shared the message with us. And his message was, I have, he has come to bring deliverance. He has come to set things right. He has come to open 
the prison doors for those of us that have been held prisoners to sin all of our lives and to release us from the bondage that we have to the enemy and the evil one who has captured us. And then in chapter 11, it kind of changes in its texture and he starts off now teaching because as he did his miracles and his popularity gained, yet so did the opposition gain against him. And we saw a return in chapter 11 where now Christ steps back from demonstrating who he was and starts teaching how we need to respond to him. And we pick it up this morning in chapter 12. Today we find Christ preaching to probably the largest crowd that gathered. The numbers of people that gathered are in the thousands, perhaps ten or more thousands people gathered in this teaching. Luke just says it was many thousands of people. It was in our fan and follower series that uh, Kyle Eidelman, the pastor who developed that series, said that as he contemplated the thousands of people that were going to come to his church on Easter Sunday, and he pondered, how do I speak to these people, these thousands of people? What do I say to, what do I say to them in their presence that will just be so captivating? And he looked and says, how did Jesus talk when he was in the presence of thousands of people? And Eidelman said, he was just shocked to find that when Jesus met with the thousands, he challenged them. He challenged them deeply with their need to, to turn their lives and to follow Christ and to pay the price of obedience and submission and surrender to Christ. Christ here is in this passage preaching to his disciples, but he's speaking in a way that others around him can hear. Let's turn to chapter 12 of the Gospel of Luke. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. What is hypocrisy? There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What you have whispered in the ear in the inner room will be proclaimed from the roofs. Verse, I'm going to go through verse 12, but we're going to walk through it in stages. Four things that, that flow out of this. The first is the main point. Jesus says to his disciples, be on your guard against having such a fear and response to mankind that you start faking it with regards to your love for God. Be of primary concern here that you not pick up this yeast of the Pharisees whose whole lives are a sham. They proclaim and show to everybody righteousness and holiness and goodness and they present themselves as being one thing but inside they are something very different. Jesus says, disciples, we're at a turning point in the ministry. I'm no longer telling you who I am. I'm now talking to you about your response to me, and your response needs to be one of sincerity. That what, how you present yourself in relationship to me is one that is true and real. It is not like the Pharisees, this yeast of theirs, and the yeast is hypocrisy. You know what yeast is? Baking bread. Add the yeast. Put it in a warm spot in a bowl. Let it rise to twice its height. Then punch it back down because it's just puffed up. The Pharisees, the danger is in religious circles, is becoming puffed up. Yeast works through the whole loaf. The danger, Jesus is saying to his disciples, that if this gets started in your life, it will work all the way through your life. It will work through, as he's going to talk in a minute, it will work through your relationship with me. And not only works through your life all the way, but it spreads and works through other people's. The danger of religion is, in this case Jesus is warning about, is the danger of hypocrisy. 
A yeast. In the Old Testament, yeast was the symbol of sinfulness and its spread. Sinfulness and it's the, how it goes throughout the whole group of people. Yeast. That's why for when they came to the Exodus period, getting out of Egypt, it was you had to leave in a hurry. No, leave behind the sin. Leave in a hurry. Don't have any yeast in your house. Don't let anything rise. And every year they go back and they have that period where they take all things of yeast and they clear it out of the house. Lest there be any the, the picturing as of any presence of sin puffing them up. Any presence of sin working its way through their lives. Jesus says, beware of hypocrisy and how it will work through your life. Presenting yourself as one thing. There was a story of a pastor that went to visit a woman that had come to his church. And she was trying to make a good impression on this pastor that had come. She was new and wanted to make a good footing in the church. And the pastor came and sat and talked. And she said to her little girl, oh, Susie, would you go and get that book that's in mommy's room in there that she loves so much? And the girl goes and brings back the J.C. Penney catalog. <laughs> the pastor was not impressed as quite what the lady thought was going to take place. To be a hypocrite was to be a Greek actor. That's where it comes out of. It comes out of the world, the world of theater. And how many actors do we know that on screen they can portray somebody like this, but in reality they're such a different person? An actor, a hypocrite. How many times do you see somebody portraying somebody that's a 14-year-old kid, and you look at them and say, you, you got to be at least 32. What a hypocrite. Well, it works into our lives that we become actors, playing the part of what it means to be a Christian. Pay, playing the part. And the reason, the drawing thing for hypocrisy is that it has to do with the eyes of other people around us. To be a hypocrite is to be deliberate in your deception so as to appear, so as to, appear to others, and that's an important part of it, to appear to others what you are not to yourself. And there's a certain intentionality to this. It's, it's what we are not, and even what we intend not to be. It's not a hypocrite to say, I want to be righteous, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to live as a righteous person, and I'm going to try to achieve to that. And I'm going to try not to demonstrate all my brokenness and my sinfulness in front of everybody. This, that's, that's not what being hypocrite is. Being a hypocrite is, is, I'm okay with my sin, and I like my sin, but I don't want anybody to see it. And so I'm going to present that I'm not a sinner. Uriah Heep, Dickens wrote about Uriah Heep, the most humblest man on earth. And his advice to his son was, you can get ahead by being humble. So put on a facade of being humble. Put on a facade of being righteous. Put on a facade of loving God. Put on a facade of obeying God. Put on a facade of being faithful to God. Because that's how you get ahead in the eyes of people. And that's what we're interested in. 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Boasting not your good works. Because that boasting works through the whole loaf of dough. The dough gets puffed up and it needs to be pushed back down. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says that everything, the truth about you, is going to be brought to light. There is coming a day when we'll all see exactly who you are. That day's coming for all of us. You're not judged. Those that are followers of Christ are not judged for that, but it's made obvious. It's made clear. We're going to get to see everything that Christ has forgiven. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, Every deed will be brought to judgment, including every hidden thing. Paul said that he's, everything is going to be brought to light and all matters exposed. That's what he says in the text here. Beware of hypocrisy of faking it or fudging it in front of people. There's coming a day where that's going to be figured out. If it's not figured out, they haven't figured it out already. The reality is people are pretty good at figuring that out anyway. But there is coming a day when it will be brought to light what's true or not. In particular, though, let me just finish with these three things that he says where hypocrisy has its most danger to his disciples. In where we left off, he picks it up. He says, I tell you, my friends, 
let me add a few verses to capture what's before. Those people who live and present their life on the basis of what people think about them or trying to make oppression because of the thoughts and the eyes of other people. That's the first part of a hypocrisy. I tell you, my friends, verse 4, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I show you, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after the killing of the body has the power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. We live in so much fear of the opinions of other people. That's what hypocrisy builds its life on. And the warning here from Jesus is that if hypocrisy settles into your life, you'll begin to, to put a fear of mankind ahead of your fear of God. That you've lived your life on the basis of what you want other people to think about what other people do. You live your life and you choose your values and you choose your obedience on the basis of them and not God. And he says, you ought to not be afraid of them. You ought to be afraid of God. These people can make you feel miserable today. These people can take your life today. These people can make you feel like nothing today. But God, if you don't live on the basis of honoring God and loving God, it will be an eternity of that. The shame that you are concerned about today and why you arrange your life to be hypocritical today, that shame will last forever. If you've chosen man's values and man's opinion ahead of God's opinion. You ought to be afraid of the one who can throw you into hell. Um, there is no easy way textually around that. None of us like, we don't like that kind of language. And so we've come up with other interpretations that say, well, well, the fear of God here is just a fear of respect and a fear of reverence. Respect and reverence? No, it's throw you into hell. It's judgment. Those people whose lives are lived on the basis of the worship of man are people whose lives are not lived on the basis of the worship of God. And the outcome for them is not heaven, but the outcome for them is hell. We don't preach hell very much anymore. We don't put that in our vocabulary very much anymore. We don't put that in our witnessing much anymore. How many of you have spoken to your lost relatives and said, I fear for you. I fear for your eternity. Your eternity is one of hell. Man, that's just repugnant to evangelicals today. And yet it is so common and pervasive in the scriptures. The reality and the joy is, though, that the judgment, the fear of judgment is, is clearly set forth in the scripture as being a message that needs to be proclaimed to those that are lost. But for those that will respond, there is a perfect love that comes. And once you've experienced this perfect love, it drives out that fear. And it leaves you with a reverence and an honor. That's why people look it back and they, they want to transport this reverence honor back. And it's not. You, start, you, can, you cannot enjoy the reverent fear of God until you have experienced the judgment fear of God. This verse humbles us that we have a God who is just and righteous and holy and a God who cannot be trifled with. Don't play with your eternity. Don't fake it and think that somehow it's going to work. But then he speaks words of great comfort and encouragement. He says in the text, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet none of them is forgotten by God? Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than the sparrows. For those people who will say, God, you're the one that I stand in submission to, and it's your opinion that matters, and, and who I am, I want to portray to you on the basis of you, not on the basis of the thought of man. Those people find a God who cares. They understand the care of God. That the sparrow, the, the half a penny, 
little cheapest thing you could buy in the market to feed your family. The sparrow that was just sold in, of no value. Take him. He says, that sparrow is valuable to God. And God notices that sparrow and God cares about that sparrow. And significant how many hairs come off from the brush in the morning. You ladies, you clean out your brushes. You think about all that hair. God knows every, that, you know, the intimacy that God has with you and your life, how deep it is. And it's not just that he's intimate with you, but he, at, at the degree he knows you, he loves you. And the fear of judgment becomes replaced with the fear of wonder and awe and love. He goes on and says, those people that live caring about the opinions of mankind, the danger is you're going to start living your life on the basis of their opinion rather than God the Father's opinion. He goes on here in the text and says, I tell you whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. But he who dis disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. Everyone who speaks against the Son of Man will be forgiven. When you start to live your life on the basis of other people's opinions, the, Jesus is teaching his disciples here, there's a danger of that. And the danger will be that when other people's opinions bring you to the point of saying, hmm, I need to, I need to be quiet about Jesus now. I need to I need not say anything. This is, this is where if I speak up about Jesus, it's going to be bad. I'm going to be quiet. I'm not going to acknowledge him. Disowning is, in the text, is, is more active than just not acknowledging. But the whole point of this is that when your life is lived on the basis of other people and your fear of other people, what extreme it will take you to. It will, it will take you away from fearing God and fearing them. It will take you even to the point of not being willing to acknowledge your relationship to Christ and who Christ is in your life. There's a danger here. He starts off and says to his disciples, there's a danger of religion, and religion lives for man and not for God. Jesus says, in this case, those that acknowledge me, I acknowledge. Those that don't acknowledge me, I don't acknowledge. But he says, that's forgivable. He says, I'll forgive that. In Manila, there's a big billboard, at least there was when we lived there. There's a big artery called EDSA. It's the, it's the belt line kind of a thing. It's, I don't know, six lanes each direction. It's right in the heart of the city. And uh, it, it moves at about five miles an hour most of the day. And you get to see this big sign that says, Jesus saves. And then there's, there's a, it's a big neon. They have a lot of big, big, huge neon signs, not like Maine where they took them all down. And this big neon sign says, Jesus saves, but, but it's got a carrot. And it goes before the word Jesus. You know, one of those little ink, ink things? And there's a word written over it. And it, the word on, is only. Only Jesus saves. There is recovery for those that have been silent instead of a witness for Christ. Christ says, I, can, I forgive that. I understand. There's forgiveness for that. The third danger here of those that will, that will live with hypocrisy is found here in the second half where I just left off. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anybody who speaks blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. This is a common phobia of, and a fear of both saved and unsaved people. Blasphemy is mentioned 59 times in the New Testament. Here's how it's translated. To revile, to rail at, to speak evil of, to malign, to, what's my writing? To give much abuse. To profane is a, my definition. To profane that which is holy. Let's consider the context of all places, three places where this is mentioned in Matthew, 13, uh, Matthew 12, the same passage. It's the same teaching. Mentioned in Mark 3, Mentioned here in Luke 12. All three of the Synoptic Gospels mention this. Pharisees say to Jesus, the Pharisees have been saying to the people when they saw Jesus do his miracles, remember the one about delivering the demon-possessed man? 
The Pharisees in the other two, Mark, Matthew and Luke, it's directly connected with this. Mark is separated by a few verses. That was in chapter 11. But it's still the context of what's going on. That the Pharisees have stood up and said, this man is delivering people from evil spirits by the power of Satan. The power that's at work in this man is evil. The power that's working this man is Satan doing this. That's the context for, for Jesus saying this to his disciples. Be very, be very aware of the impact of faking it, of hypocrisy, of yeast, this yeast that will work into your life. That it will work to the place where you start to fear men and live for men more than you fear and live for God. Where you start to lose your, your interest and lose even your witness for Christ that you'd hold back from even acknowledging Christ and you'd even step back and say, well, like, you know. And it got to the place where the Pharisees where they actually were not only their conclusion but his point about blasphemy. Blasphemy is sharing it so another person will be infected by it. Blasphemy is not just the conclusion in your heart but it is a conclusion of your heart that gets spoken and shared. All the definitions have to do with to be the idea of speaking it out. Those that will speak about the Holy Spirit, that the, His voice, His witness, His work is not the work of God. That voice that's in my head that's speaking to me, telling me to repent, that voice that tells me to obey God, that voice that tells me to yield to Him, that is not God. That's the evil one in my life. That's Satan himself. This message that's been given, I'm not going to yield to that. That's the message that's distorting truth. This is not where the, God is. That's what blasphemy is, spoken out to other people. So many people get worried that they've said something in rashness. And maybe I've blasphemed and said something against God's Holy Spirit. And I, I, didn't, I didn't acknowledge that, that this, uh, this act was by God. Oh, that's not what blasphemy is. Blasphemy is coming to a conclusion in your life that this message that the Holy Spirit is bringing you about Jesus Christ, this message about who God is and what he's done in Jesus Christ, that this work of, of God that comes through his spirit is in fact not from God. And when you reach that conclusion, there's no way back. How can you come back if your conclusion is that the very voice, because there is no repentance apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, there is no power in you to find the truth here apart than the power that's given you and planted in you by a work of the Holy Spirit. And when you say that spirit is not something to be listened to, it is evil speaking in your life, you've got no way to come back. It, will, it cannot be forgiven. Because it does not yield in repentance. And without repentance, there is no forgiveness of sin. The Spirit is the revealer of God in Jesus, and the Spirit is the voice of God, that this is truth. And to claim that that voice is the voice of Satan is to cut yourself off from the very power that would lead you to repent and turn to God. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It is not something that followers of Jesus do. But he gives a great encouragement in the last verses. When you're brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, don't worry about what you're how to defend yourself, what you're going to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. The witness of the Holy Spirit is a reliable witness and can be counted on that he as a person will be there. If, you will, if, if instead of rejecting him and his voice, if you stop and say, I'm going to depend on his voice, you will find his voice sufficient to carry you in whatever circumstance of life that you're in. There is a blessing for those that respond. There are three F's in this text before us. There are Pharisees. Okay? Can I do that? There are Pharisees, and Pharisees are people who have said, I'm going to pretend. And I'm going to pretend that I'm righteous. I'm going to make my righteousness based on my religion. I'm going to make this. But in fact, in fact, that's not true about who I am. There are fans. Fans are the people that Jesus is warning here. Fans are the people that Jesus is saying, you need to be concerned that this yeast, that this Pharisee, don't let it infect you. 
or it will work through you and you'll find yourself even, even living for man instead of fearing God. You'll, you'll be denying Christ. You'll be eventually attributing that this voice is not one to be listened to. And there are followers. Those people who have said, God, I have heard your voice. I have acknowledged your son. And I have lived in response to the fear and worship of who you are. Pharisees, fans, followers. God calls us in this text to be aware of the danger and to be encouraged with the sufficiency of God for those that will be followers of Christ. Lord, we pray thanking you for this text. Now we ask you to bless us that we might, we might find the courage from your spirit to live with the motivation from pleasing you and not pleasing man, from trying to gain your blessing in life and not the blessing of other people. Lord, teach us how to live transparently with each other, that we might help each other. Lord, thank you for the gift of your spirit who comes and shows us Christ and gives us hearts to love God. Thank you, Father, for this year. We pray your blessing upon us. We pray that you will work through this year in a way that will honor Christ. And Lord, uh, can I ask you to stand and, and join me in this closing prayer? Um, Judy, you're nearby. Would you step back and would you give Joyce a hug? Somebody else wants to give Joyce a hug. That's great too. Can you get to get out of the way? <laughs> Somebody needs to go over and give Ken a hug too. We're going to, Joyce is going to have a surgery on Wednesday in the afternoon. That's before our next prayer meeting, so we want to just stop now and have, have a word of prayer for Joyce. We had, we had prayer last night. We've had prayer several times, um, and so we want to pray as a congregation. Uh, let's join together. If you want to raise your hand and extend it toward Joyce as a, as a statement to the God that I've joined this prayer, do so. Otherwise, just pray along with me in your heart. Uh, I'll begin, and let's have two or three of you pray. Lord, uh, hear our prayers for our sister. We thank you that you have loved her in a way that has shown her the glory of Christ, won her heart, and given her the gift of eternal life. Lord, so we pray your mercy in her life, but we pray from faith, believing and trusting you and who you are and the sufficiency of your goodness and grace in her life. We pray against the cancer. Uh, Lord, we would pray 
against all that is marred and broken. And Father, we pray for cure. And Lord, we would just pray for a great outcome. May Joyce be cured of this that has troubled her body. But Lord, above all, as you've taught us in this congregation, and we remember the lesson you've taught us, you gave it to us by your servant. And we pray in faith, and we pray the greatest prayer. We pray faith in Christ. And Lord, we pray that Jesus Christ might be honored and lifted up and glorified, and that a word of testimony might be given to his glory from out of this. Lord, hear our prayer today. As we depart from this place, we go in the victory of Christ. In the name of his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this day. There is Sunday school for those that will stay. <laughs>